Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to IWP. Uh, for those of you who are new uh, to the school, we are a school and not a think tank. We have five uh, master's degree programs, we have uh, 17 graduate certificate programs, and a relatively new doctoral program, the first professional doctorate in national security affairs in the country. Uh, we specialize in teaching all of the different arts of statecraft, by which we mean the different instruments of national power and how they are integrated in the larger orchestra of our national strategy. We also teach uh, political and moral philosophy here, uh, including uh, American founding principles and comparative uh, uh, ideologies, uh, belief systems, uh, and I'll have a little bit more to say about all of that, as well as what we call the Western moral tradition, broadly speaking, the Greco-Roman, Judeo-Christian uh, moral tradition, uh, and uh, and applied ethics. Uh, because we teach people how to use power, we want our students and our graduates to use power prudently, responsibly, and ethically. Um, a, a very important dimension of our program is precisely the business of the study of ideas, values, and belief systems. And Dr. Josh Moravchik, has been central to this uh, dimension of our core curriculum. Uh, he is the longest uh, serving professor here at IWP other than myself. And uh, all the way back to, let's see, 1993, I think it was. I think it was 1993 when Josh first started teaching here and has taught every year since. Uh, has been an integral part of our faculty and uh, his course, which is called Ideas and Values in International Politics, uh, covers all of the isms, so to speak. What is socialism, communism, fascism, Islamism, the role of Christianity in world politics, and other such things. And so uh, he has written, he has a tremendous uh, output as a scholar. Um, he has written uh, uh, at least 10 previous books and over 400 articles on uh, politics and international affairs. He's written for all of the major uh, important uh, daily periodicals in this country, the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal. He's written for the major foreign affairs press, like foreign uh, affairs, foreign policy. Uh, he has written, uh, been a steady co uh, uh, contributor to commentary. Uh, he is armed with a PhD from Georgetown University uh, and has served on the editorial boards of World Affairs, the Journal of Democracy, which is a, 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 an organ of the National Endowment for Democracy, and the Journal of International Security Affairs. He has served on the State Department's Advisory Committee for Democracy Promotion, and he has a major book on this subject the uh, Commission on Broadcasting to the People's Republic of China, and the Maryland Advisory Commission to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. <laughs> he is currently a distinguished fellow at the World Affairs Institute. Uh, the book he's going to talk about, uh, social, Heaven on Earth, The Rise, Fall, and Afterlife of Socialism, is the second edition of a magnificent tome that he produced a few years ago. Um, of the similar title, but without afterlife. And uh, it is an, an extraordinary history of the origins and development of socialism uh, and its various forms, whether it's communism, fascism, democratic socialism, Afro-socialism, uh, and, and the kind of socialism that one finds on uh, uh, Israeli uh, kibbutz, uh, kibbutzes. So, uh, without further ado, uh, I just would like to turn it over to one of our uh, most valued and beloved professors here at IWP, Josh Moravchik.
put this mic down about a foot and a half. John, thank you very much. That was a very gracious introduction, and uh, thank all of you who uh, honor me by being here to uh, hear what I have to say. Socialism did more than any other idea to shape the history of the 20th century, and now, I must confess uh, to my surprise, it's haunting the its ghost is haunting the 21st. It was the most uh, popular political idea ever invented. And uh, you might make a case that it was the most popular idea of any kind ever invented about how life ought to be lived or society organized. The only thing that rivaled it was the great religions. And uh, even those, I'm not sure, exceeded it, uh, at, at least in its uh, dramatic, rapid rise. Christianity, the most uh, widely adhered to religion in history, took about 300 years before it could claim to speak for 10% of the people of the world. Socialism, within 150 years of that term being coined, governed 60% of the people of the world. Of course, not everyone who lived under socialism believed in it. But uh, on the other hand, uh, not everyone who was counted as Christian because they lived in a Christian society or under a Christian mind uh, may have believed in it either. I don't want to push that comparison Far. There's no, no real point to it except to uh, underscore how tremendously powerful this idea was. And if many people who lived under socialist regimes didn't believe in it, still millions of people around the world joined socialist parties, who voted for socialism one kind or another, uh, devoted themselves to agitating for it, and fought and died for it. The idea was born in the French Revolution and first given expression by a group that called itself the Conspiracy of Equals, led by a, a man named uh, Babeuf. And they hit upon the idea that Equality, which was the dominant theme or goal of the revolution, could only truly be achieved if it included not only equal rights of citizenship or equal social station, but also economic equality. And as they saw it, complete economic equality. So they wrote in their manifesto that they envisioned a society in which uh, that would, in its structure, quote, deprive every individual of the hope of ever becoming richer or more powerful or more outstanding through his learning than any other. Terrible thought here in an institution uh, like this. And they. Uh, organized to try to, uh, a coup to try to take over the government late in the revolutionary period. And they, their coup was rather a Keystone Cops affair. And, uh, you know, they were all rolled up and by birth, and a few of the other leaders ended up on the guillotine. But they had put down a marker of this idea of uh, radical economic equality that was, uh, remembered by subsequent generations. Marx and Engels uh, refer to it in the Communist Manifesto, and uh, honor was again paid by name to Babeuf in the founding documents of the, com of the uh, Communist International. But that initial iteration of socialism went the way of the French Revolution. Uh, and uh, the next chapter 
in this uh, story uh, came a generation later in the 1820s and 1830s in a very different form. <coughs> and that was when a group of uh, British and French thinkers, quite imaginative visionary thinkers, Robert Owen, uh, Charles Fourier, <coughs> Saint Simon, started writing these uh, th these ideas they had about uh, uh, ideal society that included as its basis uh, economic equality. We think of these people, or we know them now, as the utopians, a sobriquet that was uh, attached to them subsequently by Marx and Engels. They were not out to for political power, to capture governments, to create entire socialist societies or socialist countries. Uh, rather, they had the idea of creating demonstrations to persuade people that their ideas amounted to a much better way to live. And they thought in that way, they could gradually transform society to the models they envisioned. And so they created these demonstration communes. Although the thinkers were British and French, the large majority of these communes were created in the US, which was still a young country. Land was easy to come by. Out on the frontier, Social mores were not as firmly set as they were in Europe, so it was a tolerant environment in which to carry out their experiments. And uh, they were taken quite seriously when Owen, who was uh, perhaps the most important of these, arrived in the U.S. having announced that he was going to create a model society here to demonstrate the validity of his ideas. Uh, he was, uh, a, a joint session of Congress was held for him to address and, and uh, present his ideas. And in fact, uh, he, he had built a scale model of his imagined uh, ideal socialist community and, uh, and it was put on display in the White House when he addressed Congress uh, not only did the members, but also the members of the Supreme Court came to hear him, as did uh, outgoing President Monroe and President-elect John Quincy Adams. And uh, he uh, uh, gathered about a thousand followers and went and created this, uh, uh, this community that he named New Harmony in uh, Indiana. He didn't, they didn't go to raw wilderness. He bought a, what was one of the most prosperous communities, certainly in the West, maybe in the whole country, that had been built up over a previous number of years by a religious sect uh, that had decided to move on to some other part of the country. And they sold this community intact to Owen with, as I recall, about 160 structures in it. Uh, there were farms and there were also uh, a variety of factories and uh, and dwellings. And uh, Owen and his followers uh, uh, took it over and within about a year ran it into the ground. And uh, <coughs> as uh, there, there were many, we have many surviving letters from people who were participants in this ex experiment, and they give many different uh, kind of uh, amusing to read now takes on, on what was uh, happening then. Uh, <coughs> uh, one of them wrote, uh, instead, of, instead of striving to see who can do the most, the most energy was manifested in accusing other people of doing too little. And, and so within two years, they actually even uh, had, uh, made a coffin of a, a, an 
as an effigy of what they called the social system that marched it around and uh, pronounced its, its burial. This lifespan of New Harmony of two years was actually quite characteristic. There were altogether some 40 to 50 of these experimental communes created in the United States, and their median lifespan was two years. One after another, they disintegrated, usually in great wrangling and uh, uh, and uh, hostile feeling uh, among the <coughs> among the members. Well, if if socialism had consisted largely of these experiments, the story might have ended right then, in some point in the nineteenth uh, century. Uh, it had been tried. Now, in these many cases, it failed every time, and uh, people might have moved on. But then the idea was given a whole new life by this extraordinary team of. Uh, political prophets, Marx and Engels, who put the idea on a whole other footing. And Marx and Engels were very well aware of what had happened with Owen and, the, uh, and these other communes and how they had all failed. But they completely disregarded uh, that experience. And they derided these people as utopians. And uh, Marx wrote uh, that they, the, the Owenites consisted of organizers of charity, members of societies for the prevention of cruelty to animals, temperance fanatics, hole and corner reformers of every imaginable kind. And uh, their experience simply didn't count. <clears throat> Instead, Marx said, that he had discovered scientific socialism based on having, having discovered the, the laws of history. Uh, and therefore, this other socialism that had come before of Owen and uh, that like just simply didn't count. Uh, this seems to me to have been one of the great intellectual con games of all time, uh, because after all, what is science? As I understand it, the, the very soul of science is experimentation. The followers of Owen and Fourier, etc., had this idea about what would be a good society, and they did experiments to see if their idea, to put their ideas to the test. They weren't always wonderful about observing the results of their experiments, but there were people who had an idea and tested it. They were the real scientific socialists. But Marx came along and said, <clears throat> no, he said, I'm, I'm offering scientific socialism, which consisted of pure prophecy. In other words, Marx's scientific socialism was just uh, religious in character, not at all a scientific. Uh, and yet, this uh, confidence game was tremendously effective. Uh, <clears throat> why says something more about human psychology? The uh, Marxist historian, uh, Eric Hobsbawm, said, wrote, it was not until Marx transferred the center of gravity of the argument for socialism from its desirability to its inevitability that socialism acquired its most formidable intellectual weapon. Well, of course, this wasn't an intellectual weapon at all. It was a psychological weapon. And we can speculate as to why that is so powerful. 
it seems that perhaps feeling that you know the future makes people feel godlike or or at least uh, uh, safer amidst the mysteries of life. Marx's laws of history uh, said that history advances by class struggle and that in his time the emerging working class was destined uh, to bring about the great socialist revolution that would be the redeeming event in all human history. Why would they do this? Not because of some ideas that they would read or, uh, or hear discussed, but because the dynamics of capitalism would force them to do this. Because as Marx described it, the dynamics of capitalist competition were such that the workers would inescapably grow poorer, more exploited, more desperate, with no way out until they came to the realization that their only salvation would lie in socialist revolution. But it didn't happen. And 50 years later, Marx and Engels' intellectual heir and leading disciple, Edward Bernstein, observed that the prophecy had been disproved. That, in fact, the standard of living of <coughs> workers was rising, not declining. And that's why there had been no socialist revolution as forecast, because they weren't more uh, desperate. And in fact, statistically at that time, the standard of living of workers in, in Germany, where, which was uh, where Bernstein was, and was much of the focus of Marx and Engels' observation, had roughly doubled in the time between the Communist Manifesto in the time that Bernstein wrote. And observing this, Bernstein followed it to its logical conclusion, which was to abandon socialism. And he came up with the formula, to me the final goal is nothing, the struggle is everything. The final goal meaning this vision of a whole new society that uh, Marx and Engels had uh, put forth, and that was so uh, enticing and enchanting to many. He said the struggle is everything, meaning that he favored continuing to vote, agitate, legislate for better conditions, wages, and what have you for poor people, for working people. But the, but the final goal is nothing. It's, it's an illusion. <clears throat> This observation was rejected by many, most other socialists, but uh, one in particular who was utterly enraged by it was a leading Russian socialist named Ulyanov, who called himself Lenin. He agreed with Burns that, the, that not only hadn't the workers made the revolution, but that they wouldn't make the revolution, that they weren't growing more desperate. But for him, it led to the opposite conclusion of Bernstein's. For Lenin, the only important thing was to have the socialist revolution, and if the workers weren't going to make it, someone else would have to do it. And he came up with this idea of a vanguard party of professional, tight-knit and, and, and highly disciplined of professional revolutionaries who would make the revolution for the workers or in the name of the workers. And uh, lo and behold, in the uh, dis 
disorganized circumstances of 1917, with Russia falling apart under the impact of the war, he managed to seize power. And this changed everything. Suddenly, there was somewhere a socialist country, or at least a socialist government, not just somewhere, but in an enormous country. Russia at that time was home to about 6% of the population of the world. And uh, this was electrifying. And, and uh, Lenin quickly had many imitators. First of all, communist parties were created in every country of the world to, in the hope of uh, emulating what Lenin had done. Second of all, Mussolini and then Hitler. Mussolini was a keen student of Lenin's and Hitler was a student of both of them. They took the model in the broad scale of a, of a uh, millenarian movement that identified seizure of power with the, uh, with the ultimate redemption, though they changed some critical details. Sometimes in, in contemporary debate, when one speaks of the socialist roots of fascism and Nazism, one is criticized, well, this is taken as a kind of cheap shot against against uh, socialism. Uh, but that gets us into uh, a debate that I think is, is unnecessary. Uh, how much the, the, the two things have in common or should be uh, so spoken of in the same breath. Uh, but what seems to me uh, impossible to uh, gainsay is the origins of these movements and also Many of the things they did once in power. In, in Germany, under the Nazis, May Day, the international workers' holiday, was made a national holiday. Nazi party members addressed one another as comrade. They, uh, the economy was put on a planned basis where to outdo the Soviets in their five-year plan, Hitler had four-year plans. He also invented the Volkswagen, the people's car. Uh, and uh, the uh, regime proclaimed the slogan of equality of all racial Germans. Uh, in addition to the communism and fascism growing out of what Lenin had done, uh, there were other socialists, many other socialists, who rejected Lenin's model for being dictatorial, for being violent and repressive. But curiously, even the socialists, usually the afterwards, from this period on, called social democrats, who rejected Lenin and insisted on democratic methods different from Lenin's, but also very much uh, energized and strengthened by Lenin's victory in Russia. Why? Uh, because even people who thought that, that what Lenin had done wasn't real socialism or was perverted socialism or there were many different uh, labels put on it, nonetheless felt that the rise of socialism, the success of a revolution calling itself socialist revolution, vindicated Marx's prophecy. And it became widely believed that history was moving in a certain direction with capitalism at its back and socialism before its before its face. <coughs> uh, 
we we hear that to this day with, with uh, almost anywhere, uh, even from our own political leaders, about someone being on the wrong side of history or right side of history, is it, in, implying a certain uh, teleology, and uh, the uh, the the grandfather teleology of them all, or at least in a secular sense, was Marx's uh, formula about the, the laws of history. Well, in World War II, fascism was done away with, but it became the jumping off point for the tremendous spread of socialism in different forms around the world. Communism, which had been confined to the Soviet Union and Mongolia to that point, suddenly spread to, or over the next few years following World War II, spread to Central Eastern Europe and to China and then uh, on to other places as well. The more moderate social democracy began to come to power, that is these socialist, social democratic labor parties uh, that had a certain electoral strength all over Western Europe and much of the democratic world, perhaps all of the democratic world outside of the US. Some of them had been in governments, but had rarely been the government, a few times, they, some of them had. But after World War II, in country after country, these uh, social democratic parties uh, came, to, came to power. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and then there was a whole new kind of socialism born in the wake of World War II, and that was broadly under the umbrella of third world socialism. That is, suddenly the aftermath of World War II spelled the end of European colonialism. And there were scores of newly independent states in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. And they almost all started down a path of socialism in the belief that that would be the fast track to going from being poor and underdeveloped to being catching up with the developed with the developed countries. And this so there was African socialism, there was Arab socialism. And usually this was a kind of mishmash of uh, drawing on communism, fascism, social democracy, <clears throat> uh, and also very much encouraged by the UN, which had uh, still has a development agency uh, in, in which the official Wisdom was that countries that uh, want to catch up economically have to do so through the mechanism of state planning and heavy state involvement uh, in the economy. And so by the mid-1970s, we reached a point in which, which I alluded to in the, my opening sentences, we reached a point where more than 60% of the people of the world were living under governments that called themselves socialists. And in that moment, it seemed that Marx's prophecy really was true, that this was where the world was going. And uh, some of the most insightful Anti-socialists in, among intellectuals also believed in despair that this was true. Think of Whitaker Chambers, who wrote that he had, in leaving communism, abandoned the winning side for the losing side. Or Joseph Schumpeter, who thought that socialism was a bad idea, but it was coming and devoted his writing in part to trying to make it the least bad it could be. Uh, but despite these, this, these spectacular triumphs, uh, socialism had two Achilles heels. 
One was that it could never sink roots in the United States. The United States remained doggedly resistant to socialism and at the same time remained the most powerful, admired, and successful country, therefore holding forward perpetually a kind of counterexample. And the second Achilles heel was that the economic performance of socialist countries, one kind or another, was uniformly poor, sometimes disastrously poor. And uh, even uh, at the point that socialism reached its apogee, uh, before anyone perceived it, we can look back and see now, the pendulum had begun to swing back in the opposite direction. To my mind, the uh, first movement of that was in 1974, when Portugal came within a hair's breadth of joining the communist camp, but was pulled back from the brink of communism. And that was, turned out to be a starting point for what Samuel Huntington called the third wave of democratization, which over the following uh, 25 to 30 years, transformed global governments, governments uh, to, to making the world uh, largely ruled by elected governments, which had never happened before. And also in those uh, events in Portugal, we got a little preview of the denouement of the Cold War uh, 15 years later. That was 74. Then in 78, uh, the, uh, we had the triumph of Deng Xiaoping in China, the third plenum of the Communist Party, which declared a second revolution uh, in China. The second revolution meaning uh, changing the economic basis to allow private economic activity. And then a year after that, Margaret Thatcher was elected in, in Britain, uh, declaring her intent to kill socialism. And, and then a few years, a decade after that, or a few years after that, Gorbachev came to power in the Soviet Union and over a period of time found himself dismantling the Soviet Empire and the Soviet system, and uh, the result being that, uh, to a very great extent, communism went by the board, even though there's still few communist countries in the world, and there are other countries, that, notably China, that are still ruled by communist parties, even though they're no longer practicing socialism. But at the same time that we had this eclipse of communism, we had other events in regard to the other forms of socialism. In the third world, it took a certain number of years, but gradually people noticed that the dissidents of the third world, the dissident countries, namely the so-called four tigers, or four dragons of East Asia, which had followed a different path, had achieved dramatic economic success, while most of the third world that was still, uh, had followed the, uh, the, the different forms of uh, socialist economics, uh, had stagnated. And therefore, most developing countries started to move away from socialism. And in the developed democratic world, the, the social democratic labor and socialist parties uh, moved more than ever to make clear that they weren't interested in socialism, even though they were still flourishing and winning elections. And that was exemplified by Tony Blair, 
in England who brought the Labour Party back into power and uh, said at the time that he, quote, was not dismantling Thatcherism. And indeed, the uh, one among the campaign slogans uh, of, of his party was, Labour is the party of business. And so, across, the culminating in the 1990s, we saw that each of the forms of socialism that had existed was being undone. And, and it seemed, at least it seemed to me, but I don't think only to me, at that time, that that was the end of the story. This was something that had gone on for 200 years, over however many generations that made, that people had tried socialism in every different possible way, some of them quite benign and some of them quite bloody and horrible. But however, in, in none of those ways uh, did it did it actually work? And at that time, when I wrote the first edition of this book, I thought that all that was left was for us to try to to understand how an idea that came into the world with so much good feeling behind it, that is idealism, so much uh, people dreaming of or yearning for a kinder, gentler world, how an idea like that ended up doing so much calamitous harm, taking so many <coughs> lives. I, I won't, if, if you ask me during the question period, I'll give you my answer to that. But that's where I thought the story rested in 1990. Uh, and then, here we are 20 years later, <coughs> I don't know if it's a, a testament to the uh, astounding allure uh, of this idea or a testament to human perversity, but it's back. And uh, we have uh, politicians uh, who are right at the top of the news day after day telling us that this is the direction we need. And, and when I think about that, I can only tell you by uh, quoting what Karl Marx said when he contemplated uh, Louis Napoleon. He said, history repeats itself the first time as tragedy and the second time as farce. <coughs> That's all I have to say. I'll be glad to hear comments or take questions. Thank you for listening. <laughs> this, why do you speculate that socialism continues to be a popular idea, even though all the evidence for its effectiveness is against it? Uh, and, and why now do we see uh, all, many of the presidential Democrat candidates all espousing, just not shying away from the word? <coughs> well, I think most of them are shying away, but they're afraid to say that they're against it. The, uh, from what I can see, None of the others except Sanders have pinned on the button. But uh, it was, uh, and I really don't understand. Uh, I think that when we see these polls showing a lot of uh, popularity for socialism, and people respond that they, they like, they have better feeling about socialism than when they asked about capitalism. But those same polls also show that people, when they're asked free enterprise, actually 
like that better than socialism or capitalism. So there's a certain question as to what people think these words mean. And uh, I, I suspect among voters and young voters, a lot of it is that the government will give a lot more benefits and things will be free, uh, higher education, medical care, uh, and, uh, and uh, other goodies. And, uh, but, but I'm still, uh, I'm still quite surprised by it. Uh, Bernie Sanders achieved a breakthrough here. Uh, it, it seemed uh, tactically foolish for him to declare himself a democratic socialist in 2016 when he was running, but he uh, didn't seem to cost him at all. And, and uh, seemed almost to reinforce his image as a very uh, independent straight shooter. But I, I'm afraid I, I I don't feel to my own satisfaction that I can understand why. Except obviously not enough people have read my book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, as you mentioned, uh, communism and fascism came off of they branched off of socialism. Um, with the uh, populist movement that's going on, uh, excuse me, sorry, they branched off of socialism, um, leading to all the events that occurred in World War II and everything, and eventually, like you said, 60% of the world was under communist or socialist and communist rule. Um, with the populist movement that's going on around the world right now, combined with this revival of socialism, do you think that we're at risk of like a, re a rebirth almost of these communist and fascist ideals that spread 100 years ago? Well, uh, I would have just said no, uh, based on people who voted for Bernie Sanders. Uh, but I, I confess that I'm uh, I'm taken aback by uh, by the Yellow Vest movement in France, which certainly has that odor to it. And uh, I'm also, I, I had thought that the populism, some in the United States and Europe, uh, had uh, something to do with Westerners, Europeans, white people being uh, extremely uneasy about immigration. And, uh, uh, Latinos in the United States, and North Africans in, in Europe, and uh, of course demographically uh, Europeans are, or people like Americans, who, white Americans who are descended of Europeans, are shrinking relative to these other populations. And I thought I could perceive a, a certain anxiety there as, as uh, driving some of these movements. Uh, but then, then came Duterte in the Philippines and Bolsonaro in Brazil. And uh, so my sort of Western racial understanding of what's driving the populism couldn't really explain that. So I'm afraid I'm, I'm pretty much at a loss to, uh, to understand this. Um, I got two questions. First is, uh, um, there are many economists who believe that uh, we're, the West is in a period of stagnation, it's malaise. And that's contributing to a lot of these uh, both economic problems in terms of wealth inequality and also just cultural problems in the divide, where um, in this period of stagnation, plus faced with the rising China, um, that it's causing us to kind of fight within, whereas we really should have unity. But um, 
I don't know if that was a question, but then, sorry, <laughs> sorry, the request, my, uh, my question is at IDP, um, you know, we talk a lot about uh, educating ourselves on um, you know, the evils of dictatorial rule and communism, fascism, and it seems that in the West there's uh, a good deal of education about the dangers of fascism and the Holocaust, but very lacking, at least in the U.S. it seems. Uh, an understanding of what happened in the Soviet Union and China in particular, of course, you know, all the communist countries. Right. So what can we do um, as Americans or to change the system or culture such that we have a better understanding of um, where these systems can lead to? So obviously socialism is not the same thing as communism, but could eventually lead there. And what what, is there anything that we can do to change the education here so people have just even just a basic understanding of Marx, socialism, and communism, rather than just fascism? Um, your first comment, I just said, I don't think we're in a moment of economic stagnation. I, 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 I'm not an economist, but I read the Wall Street Journal and it's not what I read. Uh, you know, what we can do, we can uh, enroll more people in this institute. Uh, <laughs> the, the, pro the other thing we can probably do is uh, we, we perhaps should have a, uh, a project to uh, try to put the knowledge we believe we have about communism uh, into uh, into uh, 280 characters or, or whatever <laughs> that, that, that makes a tweet because I have a feeling that most information these days is conveyed in tweets rather than books. Uh, but uh, you said one thing in passing, though, you said socialism leads to communism. And, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean necessarily, but well, it's a I, step closer. Uh, but but I, I don't think that's true. And there is a, uh, a line of argument out there that, that, that the uh, loss of economic freedom eventually leads to the loss of uh, political freedom. And uh, I don't think that is true. I, I'm all for economic freedom, but Wherever we had communism in the world, it was not something that happened uh, somehow uh, through economic processes. Uh, wherever there was communism, it was because a political movement or a foreign army, by force of arms, imposed it. And it really had nothing to do with uh, uh, economic uh, processes. And, uh, so I'm, uh, my, my ears perked up a little bit because I think it's a, it's a uh, maybe I misunderstood where you were going, but, but what you seem to be saying is something that I regard as a common misconception. Yes, sir. I guess I'd just like to make a comment and then ask your opinion on if and this goes to sort of the first uh, question that was asked. I guess I just find there's a semantic problem in the United States more than anything with regard to what socialism actually is. So with some of my more liberal friends, we have debates and so they sort of say, oh well it's you know it's like Denmark. You know, that's kind of really what we're talking about, not really what's happening in Venezuela. So it's it's caused me to really want to do a lot of research and kind of figure out, you know, what are the differences and, and that sort of thing. Can you comment on I mean I think that the education system is at fault to a large degree. K through 12 for not explaining these things. I think the media is also complicit as well, and maybe uh, the semantic confusion that exists out there. But I, I don't know. I just like for you to comment on that. It's really frustrating for me. I want people to know the truth about it. So it's hard to find that in a way that they'll listen. So, <coughs> well, Denmark is not the same as Venezuela. And, uh, right. <laughs> uh, and uh, it, it would be a kind of semantic game to try to make them out to be the same thing. But, uh, but two things. 
is, and that's the one I want to say that's a bit barbed, is that some of those today proclaiming uh, social, themselves to be socialists, I mean Bernie Sanders and uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and uh, a couple of her colleagues in Congress. Uh, when they're, uh, uh, they have record of uh, at least sympathy for dictatorial communist regimes. Sanders, uh, when he visited the Soviet Union, came back and gave a press conference in which he spoke of how great their subway system was and how great their cultural programs were. And they didn't cost much, uh, unlike uh, in the United States, which he, uh, he, he, he compared invidiously. Uh, and then he, in uh, 1985, <coughs> visited uh, uh, Nicaragua as a uh, uh, guest of the Sandinista regime celebrating its sixth anniversary. And he came back and gave a, uh, an interview that you can find on YouTube, uh, which is just disgraceful in me. The, the lowest level of propaganda for the regime, uh, at repeating every single bit of the Sandinista description of what was going on under their rule in Nicaragua and telling us how they were empowering the poor people and the working people and how, they were, how popular they were and so on. And he's also spoken, now that was years ago, but he's had all these years to say, I changed my mind or I was wrong. He's never said that. And more recently, upon the death of Castro, he had warm words for Castro. Uh, uh, Casio Cortez and uh, Congresswoman Tlaib belong to a group called the Democratic Socialists of America. And you can go to their website and they proclaim solidarity with the Bolivarian Revolution, which means with Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela. And but then when they're when they're pressed or put on the defensive, they say, oh socialism, we mean Scandinavia. Well, they don't only mean Scandinavia, and they shouldn't be allowed to get away with it. Now, if they only meant Scandinavia, it's important for people who are critics of socialism not to be saying that Scandinavia is the same thing as Venezuela, because it's not. But there was an experience that went on over decades by the labor, socialist, social democratic parties of uh, Western Europe, primarily, in which when they came to power, they believed and intended that they would create socialism, full socialism, but they would do it peacefully, step by step. They would pass one law and then another law, they would nationalize one industry and then another industry, and there would be a kind of step-by-step -step mar march from a capitalist economy to a socialist economy. What happened in every case was, as they started doing this, the economies turned down. And so they backed off. What they did do was create very generous welfare states, more generous than we have, not really, I would say, different in kind from the welfare state that we have in the U.S., but different in degree, a larger uh, percentage of their economy devoted to the public sector uh, than we have, but not a fundamentally different uh, system. And so you can use words however you want. If you want to call a an economy in Europe that has a generous welfare state, but the welfare state is funded because they encourage private business and make a friendly atmosphere for private business, and that is the goose that lays the golden eggs that pays for the welfare state. If you want to call that socialism, fine, but I can tell you it's something a far cry from the uh, 
socialism that I imagined when I was a young democratic socialist uh, 50 years ago. And by the way, Denmark, you know, the World Bank publishes an annual table that they call the, the Ease of Doing Business Index. At this moment, they, they, this last year, they've managed to measure 190 countries. Venezuela is third from the bottom at, in terms of ease of doing business. Denmark is third from the top, or maybe it's fourth, I'm sorry, maybe fourth. So it's just a, 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 it's a model that we can recognize. You, you, if people say, well, the U.S. should be more like Western Europe, we should have a bigger public sector. All right, that's reasonable, as long as you can convince people to pay more taxes. Right now, no one has convinced Americans even to pay for the pay enough taxes to fund the expenditures that we currently make with, with a trillion dollar deficit. But uh, it's certainly not what people once imagined. Dr. Lutzowski. Josh, I was wondering if you could. Um share your reflections on the relationship between campus postmodernism and socialism of really of the more Marxist variety and the degree to which the ideology that basically is putting people into group identity whose historic experts have been fascists and communists uh, and who say and who are rejecting the existence of truth, uh, rejecting the existence of reason, who say we cannot listen to the arguments of these other people like campus conservatives insofar as they exist because they are part of the oppressor class and are not worthy. Uh, anything they say is going to be part of their oppressive uh, agenda. And, and so you have a, a new version of political correctness and political conformity that is, you know, I kind of think is a cousin of Marxist-Leninist political conformity, which is used to, you know, set the standard against which, against which deviationism is measured. And although it isn't, strictly speaking, uh, Marxist dialectical materialism, it is a, a variety of uh, oppressor versus oppressed dialectics. And, um, and I'm just wondering where, what you think about that relationship and where, and where you think it's going to go. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, I don't know where it's going to go. Let me, let me just, let me see if I can sort of uh, what, what I think about it or how I understand it. Uh, and uh, really, if I understand you, John, you, you, there, there are two different trends you're pointing to. One is with, you, you started by using postmodernism, but then also identity politics, uh, part of the, the two may interact with each other, yes. but, but, but two different phenomena. Uh, the relationship of postmodernism to Marxism, I'm, I'm not, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't go very far into that because I would feel in over my head. But one thing I do notice is that <laughs> in Marxism we have the idea that things aren't what they seem or what they present themselves to be on the surface. There is an underlying dynamic going on, and and that also includes humans who who, who, uh, who may say one thing or may think they mean one thing, but have some objective meaning that, uh, that flows from their position in the class struggle uh, that is uh, different than they may 
say or, or, or believe. And it seems to me that's a horribly destructive thought and, and that it did feed into totalitarianism because then uh, I know what you mean even if you don't think you mean what I know. Uh, and therefore, all discourse ends at, at that point. And it, it seems to me not a, uh, not such a big leap uh, to, to go from there to uh, postmodernism, if I understand it, which is that nothing means anything, or, or there is no uh, objective truth because everyone has their own their own truth. With identity politics, I think I quite agree with something you pointed to, and it uh, I think it is uh, um, frightening, which is one of the distinctive features of Marxism compared to previous the, the, the ideas of earlier political philosophy is uh, what I, Isaiah Berlin spoke of dividing humanitarian uh, hu humanity uh, into sheep and goats and the, and the goats are uh, malign and evil and uh, the point being that in the Marxian view the key to the happiness of mankind is not that people should behave a certain way. It's not that certain institutions should be created that would make for good government or a flourishing society. But rather, it is that one group of people should vanquish another group of people. The proletariat should vanquish the bourgeoisie. And uh, on the grave of the bourgeoisie, a perfect society will rise automatically. And it seems to me, I mean, that takes our political philosophy and puts a lot of uh, hostility, conflict, and violence in it, really no. And, uh, and what I feel I see in the contemporary identity politics is that same spirit of uh, Marxism, that there are uh, good sheep and evil goats, uh, that, that there are, uh, in this case, the, uh, the evil people being not the bourgeoisie, but being white males, and uh, that, uh, that progress, well-being of society is essentially defined not by particular set of institutions, but by this ruling class being put down and, uh, and other uh, groups of people coming to the fore. And, and so I, I, I feel we have some of the same conflict-focused spirit of Marxism, except we've changed out the groups, and so that instead of being based on, on economic class, it's based on demographic characteristics, on race, nationality, and, and, uh, and gender. But this uh, is not entirely new. This was actually Mussolini's insight. It was, uh, Mussolini was the first who saw <coughs> When World War I happened, that the old uh, Marxist belief that the working man has no country, and that class is more important than nation, that that was all wrong. But he didn't cease being a Marxist. He, he amended Marxism to say that it has to take into account nationality as well as class, and then it became instead of class. And he argued that this is still the Marxist formula, but we have to look on a national basis. Italy constitutes 
the proletariat. That it's a poorer nation than Northern Europe. So Italy is the proletariat of nations, and it must rise up to overthrow the bourgeois nations. And that was in, in uh, ways picked up uh, by Hitler, and we had that whole most horrible episode in history. And so to, uh, if we're going back to a, uh, a kind of Marxism of class struggle, except it's not class struggle, it's racial or national struggle, I, I can't answer your question about what, where does it lead, but it frightens me that it, it, it could lead to dangerous places. Since you've written a history of socialist movements, what do you see as the commonalities or the failure of most of them? Is it the fact that governments, because they don't have a profit motive, can't be as efficient as private enterprise? Uh, is it the lack of incentives? Is it the free rider problem that if I get stuff for free, I don't need to do anything? What, what do you see are the commonalities or the failures of socialism? Well, uh, I think the, the essential is the focus on the distribution of wealth to the exclusion of the production of wealth. And uh, you know, it, it, it turns out that it's probably more important to focus on generating wealth, even if it's not ideally distributed than just to assume that it exists and neglect the problem of creating it and just say, well, what's the fairest way to divide the pie? I, I was sure one other thing that uh, I think speaks to your question. It, it's in the book, but I didn't make any reference to it in the talk, although John kind of alluded to it in his kind introduction. And that is the Kibbutzim in Israel. The Kibbutzim in Israel were the, since the end of the quest, they were the one place in the world where someone finally created real socialism. It was, it was democratic, it was free, it was voluntary, and, uh, and everything was shared completely. Meals were shared. Some of them, they even shared clothing. Uh, they, they, uh, <clears throat> the children were raised uh, communally. And it was a, and now this wasn't a whole country, right? This is a group, roughly 200, I think two, two to 300 of these communities, altogether home to five or six percent of the population of Israel. They were a complete success. That is, uh, they uh, were essential to the, the Zionist enterprise in going from a, an idea of a settler movement to creating a state and putting the state on its feet. And, but once it was on its feet, and once there were, we got into the 1970s, and Israel seemed here to stay after the Six Day War and the Yom Kippur War, these Kibbutzim started to dismantle themselves and to switch away from this socialism they had practiced to become <coughs> just communities with private ownership and, and uh, private economies. And uh, uh, I, I interviewed a lot of Kibbutzniks. And I asked the question, well, when, when did this way of living start to become onerous or uncomfortable? And to my surprise, most of them answered, it always was uncomfortable. It was not a comfortable way to live, but we did it because we had a mission. We felt we were doing something really important. We were after 2,000 years of diaspora, resurrecting the Jewish nation. And this resonated when I spoke about the communes uh, in the U.S. in the 1900s. 
There were also religious communes that did share property. You can call them socialist, but they weren't created to, to do socialism. They were created to be a community of worship and, and living together to be a stronger, closer community of worship. And those religious communes had a lifespan that averaged five times as long as the socialist communes. So what I understand from that is that if you have a higher purpose, in the case of these communes, it was a religious fellowship in Christ, it was a desire to, to, to have a fulfilling community, spiritually fulfilling community. And in the case of the, the kibbutzim, which were mostly not religious, but had a tremendous feeling about the mission that they were trying to accomplish, that if, if you have that, you can do socialism. But if you don't have some higher purpose, uh, it turns out that it's not a comfortable way for people to live, being so enmeshed in the lives of a large group, rather than being uh, enmeshed, as most of us are, in, in a family, which is a, a, a small, loving, uh, intimate, and manageable group, and, and where it's easy to put the other members ahead of ourselves. If you're in a community of 200, not to mention 300 million, but if you're in a community of 200, it's, it's not so natural or so comfortable to put others ahead of yourself. And, and, and that's, uh, so I guess a simple way of coming back to something about human nature uh, that, that, that this system doesn't fit. Last question. Could you uh, um, highlight the historical fate of democracies in, in um, uh, socialism? And the second part is uh, how about the role of unions in inoculating the United States from socialism? Well, democracy and socialism, this was the point that I gratuitously brought up, picking on a couple words out of what. Uh, David said, which is, uh, uh, although I've seen it said that socialism somehow uh, erodes or destroys democracy, uh, I don't believe that's true. I think that uh, uh, socialism and democracy can coexist, except that, <coughs> except that we never get to democratic socialism. Because, well, the Kibbutzim we did, but that wasn't a whole country. Uh, because what happens more typically, as I alluded to, is that a social party may form a government, start to <coughs> implement socialism, and, uh, and the results over and again have not been very good economically, and therefore they either get voted out or they uh, backpedal. And we don't have any examples of a, that I can think of, of a uh, democratic socialist party coming into power and then abolishing democracy. Uh, but, but, the, the, but the fact is we never get to democratic socialism. So if you look at all the democracies in the world, what you tend to see is that there's a, a public sector that will at one end be about 33% of GDP, and at the other end about 50% of GDP. We also, that means we also never get to a, uh, a libertarian utopia in which there's next to no government. Uh, in, in democratic societies, we have this really fairly <laughs> modest range of choice about how much government you want to have, and it doesn't seem to uh, go beyond that range in, in, in either direction, except maybe a few percentage points uh, here and there. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I stress again, where, where we've had 
communism or other forms of authoritarian socialism, it's been because people with guns impose that on the rest of society. What about Venezuela? That, was, that might be the exception. Uh, Venezuela... Because didn't... It didn't uh, uh, yes, no, it's a fair... It's uh, a Chavez, fair come to power Chavez was certainly uh, uh, elected, I think, the first time in a fair election, and then in subsequent elections became less fair, but he was very popular. There's no, uh, I mean, there's no way to know exactly what would have happened if each of the subsequent elections had been fair. Probably by late in his term, he might well have been But now Maduro is taking over essentially his... Now, now his Maduro... Him, and then the last election wasn't at all... Um, M Maduro is is uh, just a dictator. The, yeah. the, the, the election was uh, a fraud. So, uh, yeah, I, I, would, I would accept that as a kind of uh, exception uh, in, in the It's a muddled case because Maduro didn't win an election and couldn't win uh, an election, and uh, and uh, Chavez did early on, uh, and uh, of course it, it also helped that he had almost a bottomless uh, purse of of oil <coughs> revenue, and so he was able to to. Each, each time there was an election of the Chavez, there was a, uh, a tremendous outpouring of government money to the poor to, uh, to uh, get their votes. So, but I would accept that as a, as a qualification. The, the final part of the final question was uh, American labor. Well, uh, there was just a different model in the U.S. The, the, I can't, and I've never seen anyone explain why in a, in a, in a way that that is definitive. That, you know, but uh, in the U.S., we had very strong labor unions, but they were not political like European unions, and they had a certain philosophy that said, uh, "We." are not afraid of this system, we just want our slice of the pie. And uh, they eventually got into lobbying for legislation, but they had a long history of even spurning that, of just trying to win higher wages, better benefits uh, through contracts. And uh, they tended to be patriotic and to feel that they didn't want to change the system. They just wanted to get the most they could out of it. So uh, all over Europe, labor unions were a bastion of support for social democratic labor and socialist parties. Uh, but uh, in the U.S. It, it just didn't work that way. No,